What is up folks, Jorge Anito here. Thanks for coming over and welcome back. Welcome back to Demons and Deities, a series where we try to acquire a biblical worldview of these supernatural realities. So up until this point, we've um, discussed how the biblical authors and people living in uh, biblical times would have attributed the state of the world. That is to say, um, why is the world in the state that it's in? And, you know, we already discussed that we're familiar with the fall, the fall of Adam, the fall of man, uh, the entry of sin into the world. But they would also add the Genesis 6 event, the proliferation of sins, which is what we'll discuss briefly today. And a third cause, which is the disinheritance of nations and the Tower of Babel incident. Um, other things that we discussed is uh, some of the terminology used for God. Um, Elohim, uh, to be specific, and we um, saw that that was a term uh, that connotes locale. That is to say, it's, uh, it carries with it the idea that an Elohim is not of this physical world. It, the Bible uses the term Elohim for disembodied spirits of human dead. Uh, we see that in the First Kings passage where King Saul um, goes and he talks with the medium. She says, I saw an Elohim rising from the ground. Um, it also talks of demons, which is in Deuteronomy 32, the Shadeen, which is really um, territorial entities, uh, but our English translations will call them demons, but it also refers to them as Elohim. Um, it refers to the sons of God, watchers, um, angelic entities, all of these things that are of the spiritual world, they are Elohim. We also talked a little bit about the divine counsel and that God um, enjoys participation. We see that here on earth um, as the church, the body, body of believers, that God uses the church as sort of his arms and legs, his mouthpiece. In the same way in the spiritual realm, God uses his heavenly hosts um, in orchestrating events in, you know, um, different aid, um, different helps. And so today we're looking at mainly the origin of demons. But we have to look at Genesis 6 first. Now Genesis 6 is a big deal. It's a big deal, but it's lost on us because we're a couple thousand years removed. Um, what we know about this uh, this area of the Bible is that Noah's flood is about to happen. Uh, but why? Why does that happen? Well, the Bible does tell us, uh, but there's more to it. And so let's just read, and I'll just put this on the screen just here. Genesis 6, verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as them as they took them as their wives, any as they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit will not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. And this was when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. And then the very next verse, verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. It's at this point God decides to send a flood. What happened? Everything seemed relatively fine up until this point, and all of a sudden this weird event happens. Only a couple of verses where the sons of God see the daughters of man. They come down and take wives, and all of a sudden the Bible says that giants were born to them. And it calls them heroes of old, men of renown. Um, that word Nephilim uh, translates to giants. The Septuagint, it's gigantes. Uh, but these giants were born to them. And there's a couple different ways to look at this verse. And um, so there's the Sethite view. That is to say that uh, some scholars lend to the uh, notion that the sons of God are the, uh, from the lineage of Seth. 
And so they, you know, came down and they, um, or not came down, but they, you know, intermingled, married, and had these Nephilim with these wives, but it doesn't make sense. Because the Bible, Seth is supposed to be the righteous, the righteous line, right, of Adam and Eve. So what sense would that make that the line of the righteous Seth would um, come and do this sin? It doesn't make sense. The supernatural worldview is this, is that the sons of God are these divine entities who rebelled. This is one of the divine rebellions in the Bible. Uh, we know about the fall of Lucifer, but this is another rebellion that took place where these sons of God made a pact with each other. They came down, actually the book of Enoch states, on Mount Hermon, which oddly enough, Jesus goes up that same mount to be transfigured. Um, but yeah, they, the book of Enoch says that these sons of God come down and they make this pact with each other to corrupt mankind and to take wives. And so the whole idea behind Enoch, and this is the uh, prevalent view among uh, the biblical authors, this is just the way they thought about things. They, they believed that the sons of God corrupted mankind by teaching them things that should not be taught. That is to say, um, deception, um, how to read the stars, divination, uh, magical rites and sorcery, uh, ways to communicate with supernatural beings. They taught them things that were never meant to be known. And so that led to what scholars call the proliferation of sin. And we see that there was a proliferation of sin because God states after this event, mankind was completely wicked. Every thought that man had was continually evil, always. And so it, it just, they completely corrupted mankind. And so God decides to send this flood. Well, how do we get demons out of all of this? Um, you know, demons are not fallen angels, by the way. So what are they? Uh, before we talk about demons, I should say a little bit more about this sons of God. Now, you may be thinking, that's a lot of weird weird stuff, and this is not even in the Bible, is it? Um, well, yes, it is. Um, in the book of Peter, actually, 1 Peter and 2 Peter both reference this event, and also Jude. Uh, Paul will touch on it in Galatians and in 1 Corinthians with the head covering. And even uh, the four women, the four named women in the genealogy of Jesus, um, all of these things link back to this Genesis 6 account if you study and research it. And so it was a big deal. But remember what Peter said in, in 2 Peter. He, he talked about these angels who left their first estate. They sinned and God judged them. Well, where's that in the Bible, right? It's in Genesis 6. That is the, the event that he's referencing. Jude says almost the same thing. Um, and so where they're, what they're actually quoting is the book of Enoch. Now, we don't have the book of Enoch in the Bible, um, and so we wouldn't consider it canonical. We wouldn't consider it, consider it inspired of God. But something doesn't have to be inspired to be useful. And so a lot of times, and I'm quoting Michael Heiser here, a lot of times the biblical authors, especially the New Testament ones, will quote some of these materials like Enoch in order to make a point, a theological point. Um, that is to say, I teach a sermon on Jude uh, where I go over this a little bit. I'll leave a link in the description uh, but Jude talks about false teachers and how they come in, and he references he he gives an, the example of the angels who sinned and came and taught false things, things that were contrary to the will of God, and it goes to show that God did judge them. Well, he's getting that from the book of Enoch because the book of Enoch expounds on this story, and it says that God judges these angels, these gods, these uh, lesser spiritual beings, and they are bound, and, and they are cast down, and they basically 
get a hold of Enoch somehow, and Enoch is sort of like this mediator, and they say, you know, we, we messed up, we're sorry, we, we, we created, we did this big sin, we um, create a lot of chaos, can you go to God and plead on our behalf for us? And Enoch brings the petition to God, and it is thusly rejected. Um, God is not cool with that, and he says the judgment stands. And so that's just a little bit um, about the backstory behind Genesis 6. And so now we'll get into the origin of demons. So I'm reading the book of Enoch, the R.H. Charles translation. Uh, there are actually newer and better ones out there as well. But this is old ancient material. And this is what, um, this is what it's written, is written in chapter 15. And it says, And he answered and said to me, I heard his voice, Fear not, Enoch, thou righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach, approach hither and hear my voice. And go and say to the watchers, that is the, the, the sons of God. And watchers is terminology that is used in the biblical text. You can find it used twice, uh, twice in the book of Daniel. Uh, but going on, it says, Go and say to the watchers of heaven, who have sent thee to intercede for them. You shall intercede for men and not men for you. Wherefore, have ye left the high, holy, and eternal heaven? Sounds a lot like Jude and Peter. You have left the eternal heaven and laid, laid with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men and taken to yourselves wives and done like the children of earth and begotten giants as your sons. And though ye were holy, spiritual, living the eternal life, you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women and have begotten children with the blood of flesh. And as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood as those who do die and perish. Therefore, and we're getting ready to get into the demon part. Therefore I have given them wives as... Also, as they might impregnate them and beget children by them, that thus nothing might be wanting to them on earth. But you were formerly spiritual, living the eternal life, and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore, I have not appointed wives for you. This is not something you were to go and do. For, for as for the spiritual ones of heaven, in heaven is their dwelling. There's Peter and Jude. And now the giants who are produced from the spirits of... Hold on, let me read that. And now the giants who are produced from the spirits and from the flesh, they shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits, demons, have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men and from the holy watchers. It is their beginning and their primal origin. They shall be called evil spirits on the earth. And evil spirits they shall be called. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of earth, these demons which were born upon the earth and on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict these demons. It says what demons do. They afflict, they oppress, they destroy, attack, and do battle. And they work destruction upon the earth and cause trouble. And they take no food, but nevertheless they hunger and thirst, and they cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against women because they have proceeded from them. Uh, wow, that was a mouthful. But basically, um, this is how people of that time thought about demons. They originated from this um, illegitimate union from the sons of God and the daughters of man. These giants were born to them, almost like these hybrid creatures you could call. And I realize that this is a lot to take in, and it sounds like the craziest thing you ever heard. But the, the giants, remember, their parents are the watchers, the sons of God, and human women. So when they die... Their spirit goes out from them, and that is the demon. The demon is the disembodied spirit of the Nephilim giants. And that's the way people of that time thought. And if that's true, then that begins to open up 
some things in the New Testament. Um, like when Jesus talks about demons, how they, they go out from someone and they, they seek, uh, they go to a dry and thirsty land. Um, you know, they're just roaming, looking for someone to enter into again. And so they once had a body. And so whenever all these demons in the New Testament lay possession of people, they possess people, they're desiring to have that body once again. They desire embodiment. And so, but that's not the only thing they do. They, they oppress people. Uh, the text just read that they attack, that they um, work destruction, that they do things that are contrary to the will of God. And it's their judgment to just roam the earth. You know, and so, guys, it is what it is. Um, you know, that's just that's just the predominant, prevalent view of of demons from the biblical authors. That's how the people of the Bible. That was their worldview. That's just the way they looked at things. And um, all of this terminology begins to make more sense. Uh, this thinking, I should say, begins to make more sense in some of these New Testament passages involving demons. When Paul talks about the principalities and the powers and the thrones and the dominions, these territorial entities, and how Jesus is always going around casting out demons. And why are demons, in some cases, like uh, in sevens, like Mary Magdalene, seven demons are come out of her. Jesus says uh, a demon leaves a person, goes and comes back, and he brings uh, seven more friends with him, basically. And so what's this all about? Um, we're going to get into all this material um, in upcoming videos. And guys, thank you for sticking with me on this. This is a very interesting and intriguing study. Um, this is backed by scholarship. Um, as far back as you can go, this is ancient material that we're getting into. It's new for us, but this is very old. And so, thanks for joining me. Jorge Anito here signing off. God bless.